All right, welcome to the next set of lectures about chapter nine, which is all about different lipids and biological membranes. So this is our second lecture in which we're gonna be discussing lipid bilayers and membrane proteins. And some of the topics we're gonna cover within this subject are bilayer formation and properties of bilayers, integral membrane proteins, lipid linked proteins, and peripheral proteins. And in the next lecture, uh, we will be talking more about membrane structure and assembly. In the previous lecture, we talked a lot about lipid classification. So let's start talking about bilayers. And, but before we get to bilayers, let's talk about micelles. So when we think about lipids wanting to arrange themselves, um, they, um, a lot of lipids we've discussed have one sort of area that is hydrophilic and one area that is hydro and so lipids will tend to arrange themselves where the hydrophobic parts can all um, interact with each other and maybe exclude water, which is the lowest energy possible conformation there. And the polar parts that are more hydrophilic will tend to arrange themselves on the outside. And so if you have, um, if you think of sort of individual fatty acids, right, they have one sort of polar part, that's the actual carboxyl end, and then the long fatty acid tail, they're just one single chain there. We're talking about one single fatty acid. And so the van der Waals envelope on this kind of molecule is kind of a, a cone shape. Um, and this makes them really happy to arrange themselves into micelles, where the pointy ends of the cones are all facing the center of a sphere. We're looking at a cross section here, but this would really be a sphere, um, where the center is completely hydrophobic and the outside surface is coated with that slightly more polar part and is happy to interact with water that's in the environment. And micelles like this are really great for encapsulating small nonpolar molecules in the center, and they can act as carriers for those types of small nonpolar molecules. Um, but we have an issue if we want to make larger membranes, right? Micelles are great when they're tiny like this and all the water can be excluded. But if you want to make a larger membrane, we start to run into problems, right? So if you look at this picture in part C, we still have the same sort of similar arrangement, but because we tried to make a larger sphere where the fatty acid tails don't extend all the way to the center, we would now have water in the center. And this is energetically unfavorable because now this water is trying to solvate all those fatty acid tails. A lot of, a lot of energy is uh, being wasted, or not wasted, but it's, it's unfavorable. Um, and then if we look in part D, we have an even larger example type of membrane where there's even more spaces where water is trying to fill in and interact with all these hydrophobic regions. Um, and so essentially this is just really energetically unfavorable. Um, and this is why um, we, or, and just to add on to this, um, I wanna add that um, this can be a problem when we are digesting our foods, right? If we're eating foods that contain lipids, um, it might be really difficult to just digest them if there are regions of them that are hydrophilic and regions that are hydrophobic. Maybe hydrophilic regions would interact with, um, you know, a lot of the aqueous environment inside your body, but the hydrophobic regions might have trouble um, staying soluble, maybe energetically unfavorable. And so if we want to absorb these types of molecules, especially lipids, into our bodies, we, we need help. Um, and so this is where bile salts come in. And in this picture on the bottom, we have an example of one bile salt. Bile salts can aid in digestion and absorption, and particularly of fat-soluble vitamins. Um, and they do this by essentially themselves being um, empathic, where they have one polar sort of charge end and one nonpolar end. And the nonpolar end is able to better interact with the hydrophobic part of lipids and fat-soluble vitamins, and the hydrophilic part of the bile salt is able to help interact with the rest of the aqueous environment. So I invite you to pause here for a moment and look at this bile salt picture and try to try to uh, use your an educated guess to figure out which end um, is the hydrophilic end that's going to interact with the uh, aqueous um, environment and which end is the hydrophobic end that's going to interact with lipids. And I'll pause here. Okay, and so hopefully you have identified this region over here as being the polar region that's going to interact with aqueous environment. And then the sort of rest of it done on this end is primarily nonpolar. There are some hydroxyl groups there, as you can see, but overall this has a relatively nonpolar character that's, al that's actually also based on that steroid backbone that we discussed in that last lecture.
So that brings us to what can we do now if we want to make larger membranes out of these lipids, um, but we can't use micelles, right? Because micelles have a problem with trying to exclude water from the center. So this is where lipid bilayers come in. And we see lipid bilayers form, especially when we have lipids that have more of a cylindrical van der Waals envelope. So in the previous example with micelles, we had a single fatty acid tail that essentially had a cone-shaped van der Waals envelope. Um, the lipids we see have two fatty acid tails, and so they make sort of more of a cylindrical shaped envelope. And so um, if you can imagine a, a cell membrane, here we have um, an electron micrograph of a cell membrane where you can sort of see these two distinct leaflets that show the two polar head groups. And then in the center in between them, we have all the fatty acid tails. And if you were to blow that up and draw in a more stylized form, this little section of the cell membrane looks a little bit like this, where we have polar head groups on either side of that lipid bilayer facing the aqueous environment that's either inside of the cell or outside of the cell. And then right down the middle of the membrane, the center of that little bilayer are all the fatty acid tails. So it's called a bilayer because we have, um, we have lipids that have polar head groups and fatty acid tails. And there's two layers of them that are each facing each other with the hydrophobic regions all interacting with each other in the center where they exclude water. And the polar head groups on either end where they can happily interact with the aqueous environment. And so they, these lipid bilayers are really good at encapsulating large water-filled spaces. So like the center of the cell is water-filled, it's full of water. The outside is also aqueous. And that's why those polar head groups arrange themselves on the outside to face these aqueous regions. So let's think more about those lipid bilayers. So um, we talked a little bit in our last lecture about how there are different types of um, lipids that compose the, um, the lipid bilayer cell membrane, such as glycerophospholipids and some sphingolipids and others. Um, and these, um, these all have slightly different head groups that have slightly different properties, and they might be needed in different areas of the membrane. And in particular, some are found more prevalently on the inside or the outside of the membrane, right? The, the, the leaflet that faces the outside of the cell or the leaflet that faces the inside of the cell. And in addition, there might be regions um, within the inside or the outside where you'll see different lipids. And so um, essentially, if you will think about the movement of any of these lipids with their attached head group, there is essentially two different directions they can go. So in, excuse me, in this part A, we're looking at transverse diffusion, which is also known as flip-flop. And this would be when, if you're looking at this polar head group, this lipid that's labeled an orange, um, if it flips from this, we'll call this the outer leaflet, to the inner leaflet, um, this process is spontaneous but extremely slow. Um, if you want this to happen at any reasonable speed, you're going to need to involve an enzyme that can help to flip-flop. This, um, this particular lipid from one leaflet to the other. On the other hand, if we look at part B, we have what we call lateral diffusion. And this is when a lipid just moves side to side, but stays on the same leaflet of the membrane. So if it was facing the outside of the cell, it stays facing the outside of the cell, it just moves to a different area. Um, so in this example here, our orange lipid was on the left and it kind of moved towards the right. Um, and this type of movement is very spontaneous, but also very rapid. Um, this happens all the time within cell membranes. And so this is one reason why we think of lipid bilayers as being relatively fluid. They have fluid-like properties. Um, and so um, a question you should ask yourself around now is, why? Why is this happening? Why is transverse diffusion so slow? And why is lateral diffusion so rapid? So I'll pause the slide here for a moment, and, or you should pause the slide here for a moment and think about it. And so the answer to why that's happening is um, if you think about this process of transverse diffusion, where we're going from one face to the other, um, this very polar head group, in order to end up on the other side, it has to travel through this very hydrophobic region full of all those hydrophobic tails. And this polar head group does not want to interact with those hydrophobic tails. So it's, it's possible for this movement to happen across from this hydrophilic to hydrophobic back to hydrophilic, um, but again, very slow.
Whereas with this lateral diffusion, um, all the hydrophilic parts stay together, all the hydrophobic parts stay together, just that individual molecules are moving relative to each other. So that's why that's very fast. Um, and when we think about the fluidity of bilayers, it's also really important to consider the ambient temperature. So we have what's called the transition temperature for a membrane, and membranes the lipid bilayer in a membrane behaves very differently whether you're above or below that transition temperature. So if the temperature is above the transition temperature, the lipids in that bilayer are highly mobile. And so you can see in this picture, all of those hydrocarbon lipid tails are having all this free rotation around all those single bonds, um, and they're, which makes them extremely mobile. Um, they're able to move side to side very easily, and you have a lot of motion within that hydrophobic region in the center of that lipid bilayer. And so um, ultimately this makes them very more easily able to move. And that's why we call it this liquid disordered state where they're not very tightly packed. They're all in motion um, and they're relatively fluid or liquid disordered, very not orderly. This is in contrast to when the bilayer is below its transition temperature. When, uh, when the bilayer is below its transition temperature, the lipids become stiffer. They're less mobile and more ordered. So you can see in this photo, in this picture, the uh, hydrocarbon tails are now relatively linear. There isn't a whole lot of free movement around all those double bonds. Um, and so, and we call, and they're also packed together much more tightly. And so we call the state the gel state or the liquid crystal state um, when you have this tighter packing and this much lower level of fluidity. And the transition temperature on any particular lipid bilayer depends on its composition. So the individual um, phospholipids that are making up that lipid bilayer as well as some other membrane components all have effect on what the exact transition temperature is for a particular bi uh, lipid bilayer. So now is a good time to think about what types of lipids would contribute to a bilayer having a high melting temperature. So we've, um, we talked a little bit about this in the last lecture, but there are several components that um, contribute to whether a lipid is more or less mobile or has more or less freedom of movement. So one is the length of the hydrocarbon chain or the number of carbons. So we talked about this, when we have more carbons or a longer chain, we have less mobility and tighter packing. Which contributes to a higher melting temperature. We also talked about um, another uh, characteristic, which is the degree of unsaturation. So we talked about how um, fewer double bonds um, contribute to less mobility, whereas more double bonds contribute to more mobility. So a, a lipid with fewer double bonds would have a higher melting temperature. And then the third characteristic that we've discussed is the types of double bonds that we see. So we have cis or trans double bonds. So as you recall, our cis double bonds have the long hydrocarbon tails sort of pointing in the same directions, which introduce this very distinct bend or kink into the hydrocarbon chain. Um, and this is in contrast to our trans double bonds. So in our trans double bond, we have 
Um, they look more like this with the large, the lar the long, excuse me, hydrocarbon tail um, being almost linear afterwards. And so the trans double bond more resembles a saturated fatty acid, right? Um, so our trans resembles a saturated fatty acid. Um, and so it has, excuse me, uh, it has a higher melting point compared to a cis double bond. Um, the shape contributes to poor packing or less efficient packing, which contributes to a lower melting point. So overall, if we're talking about what helps us get a higher melting point, we would be looking for trans double bonds. We'd be looking for fewer double bonds, and we'd be looking for longer hydrocarbon chain. All right, and that brings us to a practice question. So in humans, the fatty acid composition of membrane lipids in skin cells is different from the fatty acid composition of membrane lipids in the internal organs. And this is because the internal organs function at a slightly higher temperature. So if both membranes have a similar fluidity, which of the following differences in fatty acid composition is most likely to be observed? And so these choices give you options of longer or shorter fatty acid chains, hydrocarbon chains, as well as different degrees of unsaturation. And I would just want to remind you, when we have our fatty acid notation like this, the with the two numbers separated by a colon, the first number is the number of carbons, the number after the colon is the number of double bonds. So I'll ask you to pause here and think about this question for a moment. Okay, and so let's now go on to work on this question together. So in our skin, the main difference between the skin and our internal organs is that the skin has a lower temperature. Okay, and so because the skin has a lower temperature, this means that the lipids are going to um, be sort of more, more rigid or less mobile, given that the temperature is low. And so we want to compensate for this, right? So we want to be we want our membranes to have some degree of mobility. And so if the temperature is low, we have to compensate by perhaps changing the composition of the lipids in that membrane. So if we want to make our membranes more mobile, want to encourage mobility, And so we do that by, just like we talked about in our previous slide, we want shorter chains, which would be more mobile and have a lower melting point. And we'd also want to have more double bonds because this, again, would introduce mobility, which we're lacking because of that low temperature in the skin. So when we consider our <laughs> answer choices, we're looking for shorter chains. So this means we want lower levels of our 20 carbon fatty acid chain compared to the 16 carbon chain. And we want higher levels of our um, unsaturated fatty acids compared to the saturated ones. And so this would mean that choice C is the option we choose to answer this question. So now that we've discussed a little bit about lipid bilayers in cell membranes, let's talk about one of the other major components of cell membranes, which are actually membrane proteins. Proteins actually make up about 20 to 50 percent of the mass of a cellular membrane. So we think about cellular membranes as being mostly or almost all lipid, but in reality quite a, a lot of membrane is actually protein. Um, and these membrane proteins have all different kinds of functions. Um, they can control passage of molecules through the membrane, they can transmit signals across the membrane, they can mediate cell-to-cell -cell interactions, and they can catalyze chemical reactions. And a lot of this is due to the 
um, the location of the protein within or next to the membrane, as well as some of the modifications that we see on some of these proteins. Um, and we'll go into all of that now. So first, let's start with integral membrane proteins. These proteins are embedded within and are strongly attached to the cell membrane. Um, and we see a couple of examples of them here in this slide. So I'm going to change my color because I think I'm still purple. So we have three examples of integral proteins shown here with these arrows. So we have this one. This one goes all the way through the membrane. So it has one region that sticks out of the cell towards the outside. We have another region that's um, happily hanging out in that hydrophobic region where all the fatty acid tails are. And then there's another region that is exposed to the inside of the cell. Um, and then in this second integral membrane protein, we can see that it doesn't go all the way through the cell membrane. Um, it's just um, protruding from the outside as well as extending partially into that inner hydrophobic region. And then our third integral membrane protein is over here. Um, and this one, again, has um, one region that goes right through the membrane and then two regions on either side, one outside and one inside of the cell. And so because especially yeah, for all of these integral membrane proteins, they have regions that are exposed to these hydrophobic lipid tails. These regions of the proteins are going to be hydrophobic. They're going to have hydrophobic side chains on their amino acids and their sequences. Um, these integral membrane proteins are also going to have hydrophilic regions. Um, these are the regions that are going to be exposed um, on the top and the bottom on the outside or the inside of the cell. So these regions are going to be hydrophilic. Um, and many integral membrane proteins, like I mentioned, are what we call transmembrane proteins. Transmembrane proteins pass all the way through the bilayer and extend both outside and inside of the cell. Um, and additionally, it's important to note that most, or I think all, integral membrane proteins have an asymmetric kind of orientation. So it matters which end is facing the outside of the cell and which end is facing the inside of the cell. Um, so we can see particularly in this example. Um, so like, let's look at this integral membrane protein where I just drew an arrow. It has a modification by an oligosaccharide. And so a lot of these oligosaccharide, um, these sugar additions to proteins, um, they almost always fell at the face. Not always, but a lot of the time they face the outside of the cell. Um, and so it's really important when these proteins are being um, synthesized and folded and modified that they ultimately end up facing in this particular direction because the, 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 the end that faces the outside of the cell might have one function and the end that faces the inside of the cell might have a completely different function. Um, for example, um, some receptors are like this on the surface of cells where the part of the protein that faces the outside of the cell interacts with a ligand that comes from outside of the cell, while the, the part of that same receptor that extends to the inside of the cell um, might begin a signaling cascade. And if that protein was reversed, where the receptor part was facing the inside and the signaling part was facing the outside, um, it wouldn't be able to do its function properly. So let's think more about these integral membrane proteins and look a little bit more at the primary structures that we see in the different regions of those integral membrane proteins. So first let's start by looking right in the middle in this hydrophobic Region. We know this has to be hydrophobic because this part of the protein is interacting with all those hydrophobic cells that are part of the lipid bilayer, part of the cell membrane. And so you can see all these amino acids that are labeled in this sort of yellowy gold color. Um, those are all hydrophobic side chains. And so it makes sense that they would be concentrated on the inner part of that cell membrane where all those hydrophobic tails are. Um, and then extending to the outside of the cell membrane, both outside and inside of the cell, we, the cell, we see a bigger variety of different amino acid side chains there. So we'll see some polar ones, some nonpolar ones, some positively charged ones, some negatively charged ones. Um, and something else that's also really important to note are where these post-translational modifications are. And in this case, we're talking about sugars. 
So if we look at the part that faces the outside of the cell, we see these diamonds. All these diamonds represent folate like oscillations. And we see that they're all attached to serine subvarianines. Um, and they're all facing the outside of the cell. And in addition, we have this other darker green uh, sugar uh, glycosylation on the asparagine residue. This is an N-linked glycosylation, which again is facing the outside of the cell. So let's look at a specific example of an integral membrane porine, porin, protein. Excuse me. This is a this is an integral membrane protein called OMPF, and it is a porin. Um, so as you can kind of guess from the name, a porin forms a pore. It makes a, a small hole that allows molecules to pass through. And so the 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 structure of this OMPF protein is a beta bar, and we can see that over here. So we can see these nice these nice beta sheets that are anti-parallel that have curled around on themselves to create this lovely beta barrel shape that's connected by these um, by these loops and turns. And so um, that makes this this barrel sort of pore shape. And um, if you look at this diagram in the middle, this is a top view of the OMPF porin. And you can see there are three different ones. So it's a trimer and they cluster together in this sort of shape. And you can see the three individual pores that are formed by each of those individual beta barrels. And then this picture all the way on the right shows what this protein, this OMPF porin looks like um, as it interacts with the different components of the cell membrane. So this part in the middle is gonna be, have more hydrophobic residues that are gonna interact with the more hydrophobic tails of those fatty acids that are part of the lipid bilayer. Whereas the regions on either end that interact with the inside and the outside of the cell are gonna have more interaction with those um, those polar head groups that are part of the lipid bilayer molecules. So now let's talk about another type of membrane protein. This is lipid linked membrane proteins, sometimes called lipid tethered membrane proteins. And so for these proteins, there is a covalent bond that attaches some kind of hydrophobic group um, a small molecule onto the protein. And this hydrophobic molecule then inserts into the cell membrane. And so we see a picture of that here. We have this membrane, it, sorry, this protein is purple. It's tethered to this lipid that has inserted itself right into the cell membrane. And it just blends right in with that hydrophobic sort of core of that lipid bilayer. While the protein itself stays closer to the outside. It interacts with the polar head groups that are part of the lipid bilayer, as well as, in this case, the inside of the cell. And so one example of a type of tether that we see a lot is called isoprene, uh, or is made of monomers that are called isoprene. And when you have polymers of isoprene, isoprene um, we have two different types of tethers. One is called farnesyl, which we see at the top, and then another one is called geranyl geranyl, which we see at the bottom, and these are just polymers of isoprene. And so we, when we have proteins like this that are linked to farnesyl or geranyl geranyl residues, we call them perenylated proteins. Um, and these, um, these two that I just mentioned are isoprenoids. Um, and the proteins that are linked to them are linked at a cysteine residue. And so this is similar but different. We have another type of tether that is made of just a regular old fatty acyl chain. Um, and these are going to be most commonly, when we have a protein linked to them, we're going to see them linked to myristic acid, which has 14 carbons, or palmitic acid, which has 16 carbons. Um, proteins that are linked to myristic acid are linked at an N-terminal glycine. Proteins that are linked to palmitic acid are linked at a cysteine, just like we saw for those prenylated ones. And um, and again, either way, the protein is going to be linked to this long uh, hydrocarbon tail that it's going to insert itself right into that um, center of that lipid bilayer. Um, another type of protein linkage is the glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol linked protein, or GPI linked protein, much easier to say. Um, these types of linkages are um, proteins that are linked to a phosphatidyl inositol by phospho phosphoethanolamine and a sugar bridge. Um, that's a lot of long words. It's easier to look at that as a picture. And here is a picture of what that GPI linkage would look like. 
So here's where our protein is. It's linked to a phosphoethanolamine that's shown in blue. So we have our ethanolamine here and our phosphate group here. And then we have four sugars in the center, this tetrasaccharide at the core. And then finally, we have this phosphatidyl inositol, which is um, a phosphate group here, and the sugar, which is inositol. And then here we have R1 and R2. These are um, fatty, uh, fatty acyl groups, right? So these, this part that I just circled in purple is going to actually be what inserts itself into the cell membrane. The rest of this drawing is sort of the, the linker. And then the protein, again, is going to hang out on the other end of this linker, and it's going to be either interacting with the polar head groups that are part of the lipid bilayer, or just hanging out off of the surface um, on, the, on the outside of the cell. So the next class of membrane proteins, so we already talked about integral membrane proteins and these lipid tethered proteins. Now we're going to talk about these peripheral membrane proteins. Peripheral membrane proteins are a little bit different because they don't have anything that extends into the middle of the, the lipid bilayer part of the cell membrane. Uh, peripheral proteins are going to interact just with the lipid head groups or other surface components of the cell membrane. And so these have a relatively weak association with the membrane. Um, it's only through electrostatic or hydrogen bond interactions. We don't have any covalent bonding that helps link these types of proteins to the cell membrane. And so for this reason, it's relatively easy to remove peripheral membrane proteins by either adding salt into the environment or by changing the pH. One example of this is cytochrome C. So we have cytochrome C here, which is labeled in red. It's interacting with another protein called cytochrome C oxidase um, through these relatively weak peripheral interactions. So the cytochrome C oxidase is actually an integral membrane protein, which you see here. Um, this part is the cell membrane itself. Um, and the cytochrome C sort of is interacting with this other protein that's actually embedded in the cell membrane, but the cytochrome C itself is not covalently bonded to the cytochrome C oxidase um, or to the, the membrane itself. So with that, let's start another practice question. So which membrane protein type will have the largest hydrophobic region on its surface? And I'll invite you to pause here and think about that. Okay, and so the answer to that, which membrane protein type will have the largest hydrophobic region on its surface? So here we have to remember what it means. So hydrophobic regions, usually we find these buried at the center of proteins because these hydrophobic regions don't want to interact with water. So a type of region, a type of protein that has hydrophobic residues on its surface is going to have to have some other way to hide those hydrophobic amino acid residues from water. And so this is why we find those in integral membrane proteins, because those hydrophobic regions on the surface are very, very stable and very happy to interact with the lipid tails that we find in the middle of the lipid bilayer. Um, and we only see that in an integral membrane protein. For lipid linked and peripheral proteins, these proteins only interact with the polar head groups of a lipid bilayer um, or the surface, um, and they don't actually interact with the fatty acid tails. And that's why the integral membrane proteins, which do have to interact with the fatty acid tails, have a hydrophobic region that is better able to um, go through that interaction. So with that, now you are ready to answer the chapter nine, lipid bilayers and membrane proteins practice questions.